My name is Peter Sloan and I'm a pulmonologist in Baltimore, Maryland. This is the final talk in a three-part series on acid-base disorder interpretation. I'm assuming you have seen the first two talks as this talk picks up where the last talk left off. If you haven't, consider going back to the earlier talks. As usual, I encourage you to take an active approach to the problems by pausing the videos before I review solutions. Now let's get started. In the first two talks, we discussed single acid-base disorders, compensation, second disorders, hidden and complex disorders. And in this final talk, we'll discuss the differential diagnosis of the six primary acid-base disorders. And we'll learn how to incorporate some patient history to more accurately identify acid-base disorders. As usual, we will avoid formulas. For the final time, I just wanted to show you the convention, but I won't go, go over this in too much detail. Our blood gases are simply pH followed by PCO2O2, calculated by carbonate and saturations without labels. So the way I look at it, there were really six principal acid-base disorders. Two respiratory disorders and four metabolic disorders. Respiratory acidosis, as we described, is a uh, equivalent to alveolar hypoventilation where the PCO2 is elevated and the pH is low. Respiratory alkalosis is alveolar hyperventilation, again PCO2 low, pH high. Anion gap metabolic acidosis we've discussed. And non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. We also uh, discussed metabolic alkalosis in general, but I think all residents and students should have a good understanding of how to differentiate between chloride responsive and chloride non-responsive metabolic alkaloses, especially since this affects management um, and uh, treatment. So differential diagnosis of respiratory acidosis, um, central respiratory depression typically from uh, sedative hypnotic medications. Neuromuscular weakness, where you have an active respiratory center, but uh, problems transmitting the um, signal all the way to the diaphragms. The problem can be at the level of the diaphragmatic junction, the uh, neuromuscular junction, uh, whether we have myasthenia gravis or Lambert Eaton, Eaton syndrome from a um, small cell carcinoma of the lung. Uh, another cause of respiratory acidosis is patients that. Um, simply have an excessive work of breathing that overwhelms their ability to perform the work and they literally have diaphragmatic pump failure. Respiratory alkalosis, again, um, that's the um, syndrome equivalent of alveolar hyperventilation. Um, hypoxia and pulmonary diseases cause respiratory alkalosis early on. Eventually they might cause respiratory acidosis when there's pump failure. But I just want to remind everyone that um, just because we have VQ mismatching from hypoxia doesn't mean that there's any problem with CO2 exchange. Generally speaking, CO2 exchange is quite well preserved, even the presence of VQ mismatching. If we can ventilate the alveoli, we can eliminate CO2. Other causes of respiratory alkalosis are congestive heart failure, uh, causes some VQ mismatching and even some shunt. Um, the respiratory alkalosis is stimulated by pulmonary J receptors, which have a vagal feedback. Sepsis and related illnesses such as endotoxemia, gram-negative bacteremia, fevers, they are very centrally stimulatory and cause primary respiratory alkalosis. Hyperthyroidism is on the list, as are stimulatory drugs such as theophylins, progesterones, aspirin, Primary hyperventilation syndrome, which is a neuropsychiatric illness, either acute or chronic hyperventilation, and pregnancy state has been associated with respiratory alkalosis. Now, anion gap metabolic acidosis, uh, we've talked about in broad strokes, we recognize an elevation of anion gap either above normal or well above the patient's baseline, can be caused by increased acid production such as ingestions, which I have listed right over here, lactic acidosis, which is endogenous, or ketoacidosis, 
which are essentially endogenous. Chronic renal failure is associated with a buildup of a broad variety of organic acids. Um, there's lots on this list. Anion gap metabolic acidosis comes up frequently. Everybody has their uh, favorite mnemonic. Um, although most people use mud piles, the details are here. Methylene, methanol, uremic toxins, diabetic or alcoholic ketoacidosis, paraldehyde, isoniazid, lactic acidosis, ethylene glycol, starvation, salicylates. Um, my favorite mnemonic is Cusmol Pi. Uh, I like Cusmol because the respiratory pattern when we have a metabolic acidosis is Cusmol respirations. Those are the slightly fast and very deep respirations that help us drive down PCO2 to compensate for hypercap for uh, metabolic acidosis. Uh, the mnemonic for Cusmol Pi is really the same words from mud piles, uh, just in a different order, a little bit of a different style. Uh, e for ethylene glycol becomes A for antifreeze, but pretty much the same list in a different order. Non-anion gap or hyperchloremic metabolic acidoses um, are caused by loss of bicarbonate, which can be caused from GI losses, renal losses, perhaps on the basis of acetazolamide, proximal renal tubular acidoses, ureteral diversions where there's loss of bicarbonate, and it's common after treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis. Decreased renal acid secretion can be caused in type 1 RTAs, renal failure, or type 4 hyporenonemic, hypoaldosteronemic tubular acidosis. And then the final interesting metabolic acidosis is really a hybrid disorder that we call post-hypocapnic metabolic acidosis. In patients who are chronically hypocapnic, let's say they're PCO2 runs in 25 range instead of 40. And then there is a sudden correction of hypocapnia to normal where the PCO2 suddenly rise up to 40. The chronic metabolic acidosis will not correct too quickly and it stays behind. And the next blood gas that's checked really looks like a primary non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, but it's really just the residual compensation from the prior hypocapnia. Metabolic alkalosis can be divided into chloride responsive and chloride unresponsive. The chloride responsive ones are really on an extra renal loss basis where, for example, you lose um, sodium and chloride and your volume contracted from GI losses. We know that patients have very high renin, renin levels, so they have secondary hyperaldosteronism, and that encourages the kidneys to avidly hold on to chloride so that the um, urine chloride in all of these cases, um, especially if diuretics have been held for more than 24 hours, would be expected to be low, which would be less than 10. The causes of extra renal uh, metabolic alkalosis are listed here. GI losses, as I mentioned, diuretics, post-hypercapnic, hypercalcemia, bicarbonate administration, excessive sweating, and villus adenoma. Villus adenoma is the one type of diarrhea that causes a metabolic alkalosis. The other types of diarrhea cause metabolic acidosis from bicarbonate wasting. Now there's chloride non-responsive. These tend to be lost through the renal and endocrine mechanisms. Excessive mineralocorticoid uh, intake or production can lead to that. It's part of Cushing's syndrome or Cushing's disease. Uh, ex, uh, imported foreign licorice has an interesting chemical that's glycerizic acid, which is a congener of aldosterone. And uh, while we're on diuretics, we have a metabolic alkalosis and the urine chloride is high. These have in common that they're renal, they're based on endocrinopathies, and they have a very high urine sodium, urine chloride, I should say, urine chloride should be over 20. So here's the final problem set. So these problems encourage you to use um, some of the patient's history, not so much to solve the acid base, but to talk about what is the etiology of their acid base disorder. So we really have solved plenty of blood gases. Um, this patient has very severe COPD and comes in with severe respiratory failure intubated before the blood gas is obtained. 20 minutes after they're on the ventilator, they're on assist control at 16 breaths per minute. ABG shows 
pH 7.60, PCO2 of 40, PO2 of 80, bicarb of 40, saturation 99% with a normal anion gap. What's the etiology of this severe alkalo alkalosis? Uh, I want you to pause, but before you pause, I want you to think about the etiology. I can even tell you that this is a rather severe metabolic alkalosis. Problem 16. Well, let's go over the answer to problem 15 first. So although this is a metabolic alkalosis, we don't really have a good explanation, and we can only guess what caused it. We can look at the differential diagnosis, but in this case, what we commonly see is patients who are, who are chronically hypercapnic. Let's say this patient's PCO2 is usually in the 70s, and may have even gone higher right before he was intubated. If by using these quite aggressive ventilator settings, 16 breaths per minute is quite a high rate for someone that might be chronically hypercapnic. We may have acutely blown his PCO2 down from its usual high level of 70s down to 40 acutely. So what's left is the bicarb doesn't have any time to drop because that will take a f several hours to several days to normalize. So it's the appearance of a metabolic alkalosis, but this is called the post hypercapnic metabolic alkalosis and the mechanism is really a sudden drop of PCO2. It's kind of similar to a respiratory alkalosis. It's as if he dropped, it is as if he dropped his PCO2 from 70 down to 40. So the second problem is a 75 year old female with severe rheumatoid arthritis comes to the ER complaining of severe hand pain and is noticed to be tachypnic and confused. The blood gas shows a pH of 7.4 PCO2 of 20, PO2 of 80, bicarb 12, saturation of 98%, anion gap of 25. Rather than asking you the acid-base disorder, we want to ask you what's the etiology of the derangement. So this is a tricky problem. Um, so let me let you think about what are the acid-base disorders and what's the etiology. Pause and then come back. Okay, I can see that you're back. Let's solve the acid base first. It has a normal pH, so we know that there's either zero acid base disorders or at least two, but there really shouldn't be one. So what are the acid base disorders? There's a respiratory alkalosis and a metabolic acidosis. It's an anion gap elevated metabolic acidosis because of the elevation of 25, and the elevation of 25 is pretty much in concert with the drop of bicarb to 12. They're both about 12 out of range. So we don't really have to account for an abnormal delta delta. So in summary, the acid base is a mixed primary respiratory alkalosis and an anion gap metabolic acidosis occurring in the same patient at the same time who is confused with hand pain has arthritis. And when you look at the differential diagnoses of these two problems, there's a lot of combinations that can cause this, and we really don't know why she has this. She can have sepsis syndrome. She can have two different things going on. But the only thing that comes in common between those two lists is aspirin intoxication. And in fact, you can just about imagine an older patient with rheumatoid arthritis overdoing the aspirin because she's in so much pain. So here's the... Um, explanation of the two answers I just went over so you can have them for your records here. And I want to uh, finish by saying that I hope you enjoyed this series of talks. Uh, I don't expect it's possible you'll have a complete mastery of acid-base interpretation in under one hour of course material, but I think this will really point you in the right direction, so feel free to return to these clips after you've had more experience in the hospital with your patients. Again, I invite you to view my talks on PFT interpretation, which can be found simply by searching YouTube for PFT interpretation. And I really want to thank the loyal um, students and residents and whoever for th sticking with me to the very end of a almost one hour series. Thanks again.